I worry that we, one way or another, are discouraging our, 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 our children, the ones we ought to be really committed to helping on the way. Yes. And you're on the front line uh, of um, educating people here at this university, so uh, you've actually been writing about it a bit. Um, you've recently documented an alarming trend of millennials, or those born between 1980 and 2000, effectively dropping out yes, yes. Of, of social and civic life, um, men in particular. Can you give us a feel for what you're, what you're seeing and what you think might be driving it? Well, I think some of it is this sense of hopelessness, which is partially the climate change. You know, you, I think globally it's like half of young people think the world is not going to be here in 10 years. I mean, you don't teach people history. You, this is not what the scientists are saying. Of, of course not. Even the gloomiest scientist predictors are not saying we're going to starve. You know, they're saying it's going to be rougher, it's going to be wilder, it might be harder to handle. They're not saying it's going to come to an end. That's the politicians and the media. Right. And and uh, and, the, and the tech billionaires. Right. Uh, well, you know, because it's it's good for them. You know, so, so I mean, I think what's happened is we, we also have not taught the kids um, the values of Western civilization. Um, you know, um, I was talking to a, a student the other day and, she said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a class on Shakespeare, but it's Shakespeare and race. And I said, well, don't you think you ought, first of all, you're talking about somebody who never met a Jew, never met a black person probably in his entire life. England at that time was, uh, as the Germans would say, Judenfrei. Uh, you know, the, the, the um, Shakespeare has got so much more to say than to focus on that issue. Yeah. And particularly because many of these students have never really studied Shakespeare. No. But we now have a situation where there are major universities where you can get a degree in English without having studied Shakespeare. The guy invented the language. I mean, basically, how I don't understand how you do it. You know, it's just like when I was a student in, uh, in Latin, you know, bizarrely enough. Um, if you didn't reach Virgil, you... You couldn't possibly think that you, you knew Latin because Virgil was the leading poet of the, of, of the Roman period. So what we're doing is we're taking from our kids all the joy and all the accomplishments. Yes, there were horrible things that happened. But you know what? For every Jefferson Davis, you've, you've got a Frederick Douglass. You know, you've got, you know, there's a lot to be very proud of in this country. You know, when people say, well, this is a hopelessly racist country, I said, you know what, 600,000 Americans died over the issue of slavery, basically. And, and you've had a black president elected right. twice. Right. Um, and and, 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 and um, African Americans are a very prominent part of this society. In is it, can I put a really, and this is not meant to sound offensive at all, but it's, it's a genuine question. Is there a country that a black person would have more opportunity in, in the world today than in America? Well, it all depends. You know, I like, suppose if you were very well educated African American and you moved to Norway, you know, probably, you know, they'd be so happy to have you that it, it, it might do well. But for the average African American, I think uh, the African American economy is, is about the you know, size of sub Saharan Africa. So the, this the, the Hispanic yeah. population in the in 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 the United States is by far the wealthiest population. The African population in the United States is by far the wealthiest population. And by the way, Africans you know have done pretty well in in, in, in some cases in the UK as well. You know there are you know so I I think that that what what we forget is yes there have been disadvantages but there's, there's we've made such enormous trans transformation, you know. But Black Lives Matter never seems to obsess about some of the terrible things that are happening in places like Nigeria. Oh, yeah. Where many blacks live in daily fear of their lives. As a proportion of the population, it's tragically high, the number of people who, who are not safe. Right, well, but you see. Let alone have, a, have no economic opportunities. I mean, and that's why I think that, you know, part of what we need to do is we need to say, hey, look, Yes, this country's had a lot of bad things that have happened over time. You know, you had the experience with, with the Aborigines. We had the experience with the Native Americans. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly, and slavery, there are terrible things. But think about what this country is like now. Like, you know, I, I said to my, my girls, I, I said, you know, my kids, 
You know, I'm old enough to remember when I went to Virginia with my parents in 1960, that there were colored only hotels. I remember asking my mm. father, I said, what, what is that? Because, you know, we didn't have that in New York. And to, when my kids said, no, that couldn't have been. I said, you, you don't understand. You didn't see black people on TV. You didn't see, you know, I mean, the, you know, some of the sports didn't really uh, integrate until the 50s. I mean, so, but think about where we are now. I said, if a time traveler from 1960 came to the United States today, they would be astounded by the diversity, not just relative to African Americans, but Hispanics, Middle Eastern, uh, Asian of all different kinds. This is a vastly different country and it's got enormous potential. So I want to at least make some positive statements. You know, I'm, I'm working on a story right now for the, the City Journal in New York about, about restaurants that did well um, out, out of COVID and came out of it. Every single one is either Asian or Hispanic, you know, and the, and, and then you, you see what they're doing with their food where they're bringing in influences from Mexico and, and, and combining them with influences from the Middle East. I mean, they're just fantastic possibilities. And a society like Canada, Australia, United States, the UK, you know, to some extent, New Zealand have this capacity to create a new kind of culture. And, but isn't that the point? That we're decrying the institutions of our freedoms, partly because so many people in them have behaved so badly that we don't trust them anymore, but the democracies have been the systems that have been able to say, even at horrific costs like the Civil War, this is not right. We've got to correct this. And if we're going to give up on democracies being the best way to evolve change when something's unfair, what are we going to resort to? because none of the autocratic or the feudal sort of societies that you've been writing about ever work out very well for those who are at the bottom of the pile. And look, where do immigrants want to go? I mean, it, it, yeah. they're, they're all going, they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to France, they're going to England, they're going to Australia, they're going to the United States, they're going to Canada, you know, because those are, are free societies. And I sometimes find that my immigrant friends are much more aware of the value of this society than the second, third, fourth generation. Yes. You know. That's I mean, certainly true in Australia. Yes, yes. They're so, often the people who'll say quietly when you get into a cab and the driver, you know, has been from Eastern Europe or something, they'll just quietly say, I'm really uncomfortable about something. I can see where that's drifting. Why can't Australians see it? And particularly if you're coming from Eastern Europe, or you're coming from, yeah. uh, you know, some repressive environment, and you, and you start seeing the government starting to censor speech or, or, or you know, th that, that, you know, like during the lockdowns where you couldn't do anything. I mean, one of the, the things that I think we, we, we need to understand is that there is a resentment to all this, con against all this control. It just doesn't have really a voice. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, and unfortunately, the only voice that gets associated with that dissent is Trump. That's why... That's why Biden is desperate to paint the entire opposition to his policies with Trump, because Trump is the best thing the Democrats have going for them. Yeah. But at what cost? I mean, the attacks on the Americans who have vented, let's put it this way, as I see it, Trump may have been a divisive figure in some ways, but he was more the product of division. I agree totally. So no he should one... never have gotten that far. Biden, the President Biden, it seems to me, if I can be so bold as an outsider, has talked a bit about reunifying the country, but he's just launched, as we said here, the most extraordinary attack. And this has been... He says it's only the MAGA Republicans, but then the, the speech goes on to make it plain, basically all Republicans. Well, that's a huge slab of your fellow and Americans. And the greatest irony here is the Democrats have been funding extreme MAGA candidates against moderate Republicans. That's just, well, I shouldn't say it's blanket, it's corrupt, but it looks pretty, that's pretty cynical. It's very, I mean, their hope is we'll run against these lunatic Trumpistas and we'll beat them. Now, we, what will end up is we'll end up with at least a few of those lunatics in the, in the Congress. Mm -hmm. Just what we need is another group of lunatics. Back to the disengagement by young people. Um, this sort of dropping out. This is the age of disengagement. Yes, definitely. 
uh, my listeners will have heard me say this before, but Lord Sumption on one of these conversations commented that in the 50s and 60s in Britain, the Labor Party and the Conservatives between them had more grassroots members, had around 3 million grassroots members today. The Royal Society of Birdwatchers in Britain has more members than the political parties combined. Really? That's and in the countries where voting's not compulsory, huge numbers just never turn out, and particularly young people hardly ever bother. Well, not hardly, but many of them don't even register. 